Support for this podcast comes from Neutrogena Hydro Boost. Does your day last all day? Keep your skin dewy, soft, and smooth all day. New Neutrogena Hyaluronic Acid Serum quenches skin with two sizes of hyaluronic acid, dermatologist-recommended glycerin, and vitamin B5. Just apply in the morning for fragrance-free hydration that seals it in for 24 hours. Neutrogena Hydro Boost Hyaluronic Acid Serum. Stay dewy, soft, and drenched in hydration. Learn more at Neutrogena.com. In an era of online retail where everything is just a few clicks away, buying a car should be no different. That's why at Carvana, you can buy a car 100% online. We made it easy to browse, view, and buy from over 10,000 cars. You can even trade in your old car, all while binge-watching your favorite TV show. Afterwards, we'll deliver your car to you. Or you can pick it up from one of our car vending machines. Either way, your car comes with a seven-day return policy. So grab a seat, relax in your comfy pants, and enjoy the new way to buy a car at Carvana. The key to sustainable leadership lies in the ability to thrive in uncertainty, ambiguity, and change. Grand Heron International brings you the Coaching Assistance Program, giving your employees on-demand coaching to manage through a challenging situation and arrive at a solution. Visit grandheroninternational.ca slash podcast to learn more. This podcast is part of the C-Suite Radio Network, turning the volume up on business. Welcome to the Keep Leading Podcast, a podcast dedicated to promoting leadership development and sharing leadership insights. Here's your host, the Leadership Accelerator, Eddie Turner. All right, everyone, I am excited to be back again for another episode of Keep Leading Live. It's been a little while since my last episode, and I am delighted to be here with you to talk about, uh, share with you, obviously, uh, a live recording of the Keep Leading podcast. The Keep Leading Podcast and Keep Leading Live are dedicated to leadership development and insights. Of course, I'm your host, Eddie Turner, the Leadership Accelerator. I work with leaders to accelerate performance and drive impact through the power of executive and leadership coaching, facilitation, professional speaking. Well, today I'm going to talk about leading as an entrepreneur. And as we talk about leading from an entrepreneur, leading as an entrepreneur, we're also going to talk about how we build a winning culture inside of organizations. Mm-hmm. To do so, I want you to meet two very special people who joined me. I am absolutely excited to have with me Bonnie Harvey and Michael Goulahan. They are the founders of the world's largest wine brand and they're international keynote speakers and New York Times best-selling authors. They got one of the books right here, <laughs> The Barefoot Spirit, How Hardship, Hustle, and Heart Built America's Number One Wine Brand and The Entrepreneurial Culture, 23 Ways to Engage and Empower Your People. Michael and Bonnie, welcome. Thank you. We're delighted to be here, Eddie. Hi, Eddie. Hello, hello, hello. I can't tell you how excited I am to have you all here with me. I had a chance to meet you all virtually a couple of months ago uh, at the C-Suite Network's Thought Council uh, meeting where our CEO, Jeff Hazlett, interviewed you two. And I was just fascinated. And I said, hey, I know Jeff Hazlett, but I want to be able to talk to them, too, and share them with my audience. Well, we're glad you did. Well, one of the things that was so intriguing about what you all said uh, that I loved hearing was I want to talk about this new book and about culture, but my audience is made up of people who are all about leadership. So I want to talk about your entrepreneurial journey to start. Can you share that with us? Oh, (laughs) where do you start? Right. (laughs) Um, Michael and I have always been self-employed. We've been consultants in uh, to various types of businesses, 
And when we moved here to Sonoma County, this is where in Northern California, where there's many, many grapes grown, there's lots of wineries. So a lot of our, our, our clients were in the wine industry in one way or another. So as business consultants, we learned a lot about business. However, we really knew nothing about the wine business uh, until we kind of fell into it backwards. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. So Bonnie had a client that she was working for uh, who was owed about $300,000 uh, from a winery. She asked me to for go- For his grapes. Yeah, for his grapes. He's a grape grower. And uh, the winery didn't pay him. And he didn't pay him for three years. Wow. And so finally Bonnie noticed this in his accounts receivable and asked me to go collect. So, you over at the body man, huh, Michael? <laughs> well, you know, I just met her about a year before this. Okay. So, so here I am, you know, going to go play the heavy. Well, when I get there, they've already declared bankruptcy. And the only thing I could get out of them was goods and bottling services. Now, the goods were, were wine in bulk, right? And the bottling services. So we got wine in bulk and bottling services instead of money to pay the debt. <laughs> but it was better than a stick in the eye, you know. I mean, it was something. And we thought, you know, well, we'll just come up with a label. We'll come up with a marketing program. We'll learn everything there is to know about compliance. We'll learn everything there is to know about distribution. How hard could it take, right? Uh, how hard could it be? How hard could it be, you know, it's like, now, How long you start with take? no money and no experience is what I heard you say. That's right. <laughs> yeah. um, actually, because we were such outsiders and because we had no money, it really was to our advantage. We didn't throw money at any problems. We had to work them out. We had to be innovative. And we didn't have money for advertising. So we went into the community where our end user would be, where we would find them around the markets where our product was. And we found out what they were interested in besides a bottle with a cute foot on it. Okay. And they were interested in a new playground or, or a library or cleaning up the Creek or something. And we would support their fundraisers. So, that worked very well for us by supporting the community. The community in turn supported us and really helped our sales. Wonderful. And somehow, miraculously, you went from that beginning, no industry experience, no money, to building the world's largest brand and America's number one brand, if I understand that correctly. Yes, it is. We didn't build it to number one. Our acquirer did. Okay. But we had it for 20 years, and uh, the baked-in philosophies that we had with Barefoot, our acquirer took on and continued with, which was supporting the community. Well, the, the thing is, you know, when you, when you talk about uh, our travel, you know, from the laundry room to the boardroom, uh, it, it was a rough ride. You know, <laughs> we learned a lot. We learned a lot of lessons the hard way. Uh, I, I would say that most entrepreneurs go out there with a good idea and uh, really no idea about how to get it there. So they really the underestimate market. the distribution process. Uh, they underestimate what it takes to get the word out. Uh, they underestimate what it takes to hire and train and keep people and keep them in, engaged. Uh, they underestimate all that stuff because they're focused on their product and their end user. And mm -hmm. they forget that between the product and the end user is a whole ton of people, you know, that you got to get along with. They got to like you, you know, yes. and uh, that's quite a little lesson uh, you know, it takes most people about four or five years to learn that lesson. It did us. Uh, yeah, we were pretty thick headed. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, the, the, the thing is that the company's success, any company's success, is really a function of its people. It's not the product. People don't buy products, they buy people. See, because they want to know hey, do you stand behind this product? You know, do you guarantee it? You know, I want the one throat to choke, right? So I want, somebody, I want somebody who's responsible here, you know. I don't just want to buy a product. 
And so that's that's kind of the lesson we learned. When we started, we were, you know, we were all about, you know, uh, you know, the, the, the features and the benefits and the pricing, right? Yes. And I mean, here we had a $5 bottle of wine with gold medal winner and a cute foot without, <laughs> what the heck, you know? It's a slam dunk. It's a right? slam dunk. Well, it was more of a slam. <laughs> they want one throat to choke. I've never heard that, Michael. <laughs> yeah, they do. They want the one person who's responsible yeah. when they make that purchase. Yes. No, I got you. I just never heard it put quite that way. I love it. So, <laughs> yeah. So you realize something that it takes people, as you said, even yourselves a while to understand. And that is it's about the people, yeah. not the products. Yeah. It's about the company culture. And the company culture always comes from the top. And as Michael said, we really made all the mistakes in the book to start with. But eventually we did understand how to work with people and we understood how to uh, maneuver through the distribution network and the distributors, uh, the retailers, the salespeople. And by going out and asking a lot of questions of all these people, that is how we found out about it. And we did that, again, because we didn't know anything about the industry. So this is how it was an advantage to us to not step into an industry that we felt we knew everything about. It would have, if we had done that, Barefoot wouldn't be in the market today. But because we asked a lot of questions of people and tried to see how we could give them what they wanted, um, from the top to the bottom, everybody in between, that is why Barefoot was successful, because we were satisfying a need of a great number of people. I love the way you explain that there, Bonnie. And it reminds me of a quote that Marsha Reynolds uses often, my coach. And she talks about how in coaching, uh, if we approach things uh, with a beginner's mind, um, with our, with our, with our clients, the beginner's mind, there are many possibilities. In the expert's mind, there are a few. And that's right. right. So because right. you all were beginners, you were curious, endlessly curious. You didn't yeah. go in with this body of knowledge. and This is the only way to do it. And that made you such a success. Yes, that was really that was really it. So a lack of funds and a lack of knowledge were our greatest assets for success. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Did you say, go ahead. Michael. Well, say, and, uh, you know, we advise our clients today. Make friends in low places, okay? Those are the people with dirt under their fingernails. I These like are the that. people yes. who really move the product. And uh, what we did, in our, now we were in the CPG, consumer packaged goods business, right? But uh -huh. when you think about it, your life is filled with consumer packaged goods. You go to the store, you go on Amazon, it's all consumer packaged goods. So you have to ask yourself, you know, how do they get there? How do they become for sale? Why is it in my face and why am I buying it? Uh, all of that, in our case, we didn't have the background to know what to do. Mm -hmm. So we went out and we asked people who were driving forklifts. We were asked, asked people who were running uh, bottling lines, people who were putting bottles on the shelf. They were clerks. So these are not the these are not the the white collar workers, uh, the college educated folks that you would think, or the people who've been in the wine business for four and five generations. These are the people who are actually doing the work, and they could tell us from their standpoint what worked and what didn't in terms of packaging, in terms of label, in terms of logo, uh, all of this stuff. You know, uh, pricing, handling. You name it, and and it was a terrific education for us. Most of those people have never been asked before, so they just spill. They, <laughs> they're gratified, and you know that was one of our secrets. Was we we call it uh, know the need, as opposed to need to know. So most businesses and most people have the you know the need to know basis, right? I'm going to keep you on a need to know basis. You don't need to know, they say. But if you ask people, if you tell people, here's my problem, here's what I want, here's what I want to do, you know, how can I do it? That's giving them the need. Yes. So now they know the need. <laughs> See, now they can tell you what they know about it. But if you're yeah. trying to tell them what you've got to sell, you've already solved all the problems, you know. And uh, that, that's, a little, that's a little different attitude, you know. It's a little more humble, you yes. know, but it's yes. a whole lot more practical in the long run. 
<laughs> know the need rather than need to know. I love that, Michael. And so pulling that together with what Bonnie said earlier, uh, it sounds like even this idea that the lack of resources initially made you more innovative. And then you put that together with, you said, getting to know the people in the trenches, people in low places to really the people who are actually doing the work. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. They're your best allies. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, it sounds like we have someone uh, tuned in from Facebook who agrees with you. Sunday, he says any successful company is about the people, not the product. So he agrees with you too. Yeah. Amen to that, Sunday. You're absolutely right. Absolutely. You know, when you walk into a a building, you can't do that anymore, but you know, when you get on the (laughs) phone or, or or, or you're talking to somebody, another company, you know, right away, what the owners think and what they value because of the way that that person treats you. Mm -hmm. So it comes from the top, you know, all the way down. And, you know, you can't create a positive company culture unless you realize that the backbone of all successful company cultures is sales. It's that simple. If you're not making sales, you don't have any money to pay anybody. So it doesn't matter, right? You're out of business. (laughs) To make a sale means that you have to provide customer service and you have to give the customer the experience that they expect and even more than they expect. And that comes from the top. So it's up to the leader to educate the people about where the money comes from, right? It comes from the customer. Yes. My, uh, one of my mentors, Bob Dean, he used to say that the customer experience will never exceed the employee experience. (laughs) Amen. I like, I like that. Yeah, absolutely. And we felt that our customer was everyone who touched our product. So it was our vendors, our distributors, the distributors management, salespeople, the retailer, the retailer's clerk, and finally our end user whom we found in the community. And, and they all had different needs. Yes. <laughs> and none of them, except for the end user, was interested in a good bottle of wine at a good price. Okay. You know, they had different needs. They had different needs. So, I mean, what, what would happen if you walked up to the guy who owns a distributorship, you know, in the Twin Cities, and you started talking to him about how great your product was and how low the price was, when he really wanted to know if you've already been okayed for MGM chain stores in the Twin Cities that has 200 stores, and if he's going to get to distribute your product to those stores, which is going to improve his strategic position in the marketplace. So you see, see that it's a lot different. It's a lot different than, <laughs> than wine. Yes. Yes, it is. Well, you all have mentioned this foot a couple of times with a logo. Now, I understand there's a story about this logo. And there is a story about and Before you tell us the story, let me just share it with my viewers who may not, I don't know how they cannot know about the Barefoot Wine if they haven't seen it in the stores, but let me just share this uh, before you tell the story. And uh, there we go. Here is a picture of what it looks like. And now I'll ask you to tell us the story about the logo. It started with Michael going out into the marketplace to find out what the chain store buyers wanted. Uh, it, it's really a terrific story, and it's in our book, Barefoot Spirit. But the bottom line is he said that he wanted a salt and pepper act, put it in a pig, make it better than Bob and cheaper than Bob. And w- what that meant was he wanted a red and white varietal. He wanted it to ro- Bob being Robert Mondavi. Ah. Oh, He wanted it better and cheaper than Robert Mondavi, which was really a lot to ask for. And he wanted it in a pig, which was a 1.5 liter. Well, that's where there was more space in the market for a new product. It was less crowded. There was maybe at the time five or six different uh, wineries that were producing the big bottle of wine instead of the usual 750 milliliter. And so that gave us a huge advantage right away. So we thought, well, another thing that he asked for, the buyer, was that the name be the same as the logo and that it be something that is easy to pronounce, totally in English, no French, 
and he wanted a label that would jump off on the shelf. So she, the female shopper, another point that we learned right then, who buys the most wine, could really? see it when she's pushing her cart down the aisle. Okay. From four feet away. So that was all a lot of great information. And that's when we went to the bottling line manager and asked him about labels. We went into the stores and asked clerks about labels. And we looked at the, the uh, wine department and we saw it was like a pizza out there. There was so much going on. It was really hard to figure out how we could get something that would really jump right off the shelf. So we finally realized that we had a friend um, that had been bottling wine with the name Barefoot and it had been off the market. It was Barefoot Bynum. It had been off the market for about 15 years. And so we said, well, Barefoot's the way grapes were originally crushed to make wine. Well, that's perfect. Okay. And if we put a big foot on the label and a lot of white around it, then that's going to make it stand right out. The name's the same as the logo. So we, we solved that creative problem. And um, it would be easy to remember, easy to pronounce. And so that is a big part of the story of, of how the foot came about on the label. Yeah. So then, so Bonnie uh, tells this artist in LA is a friend of ours to uh, drop a foot for a label. And she does, and Bonnie doesn't like them because they're too squat or this or that. And uh, she tells the artist, well, you know, I want a long, thin foot with a high arch. And so the artist in frustration finally says, well, just take a photograph of, or, or, you know, send me a picture of one and, uh, and I'll copy it. So Bonnie's thinking, now, where can I get a picture of a long, thin foot with a high arch? And then she goes, I've got one right here on the end of my leg. <laughs> so she sends me out for the biggest ink pad. stamp, you know, the biggest pad, pad that she, you can find. And she puts her foot in it and puts it on the artist paste, uh, paper and Fed exits down to L.A. and says, more like that. <laughs> so that's how her foot got on the largest selling label in the world. <laughs> so Bonnie has literally put her stamp around the world, made her mark. <laughs> I, I wanted it. to dance on everyone's table. <laughs> I love it. Well, I am absolutely enjoying my conversation here with you, Michael Houlihan and Bonnie Harvey, founders of Barefoot Wine, America's number one brand. And we're going to take a quick pause here to talk about some of the folks that allow me to do what I'm doing. And we'll be right back with you all. Hey, everybody, it's Elaine Welteroth, and I'm hosting a new podcast called Built to Last by American Express, where we will dive deep into the stories, history, and continued legacy of small businesses that shape American culture. Our debut season will focus on Black-owned small businesses that need our support now more than ever. In each episode, we feature the story of a Black business trailblazer that has inspired a modern Black-owned business. First up is Pinky Cole of Atlanta's food truck turned restaurant, Saleti Vegan. We'll also chat with Hanifa Muemba, the cutting edge designer behind the Hanifa 3D digital fashion show. Plus, we'll check in with Issa Rae, our modern day Renaissance woman. We hope that it encourages all of our listeners to support these businesses as well as the black owned businesses in your own communities. Tune in for these amazing stories and others on Spotify, Apple, YouTube, or wherever you get your favorite podcasts. Support for this podcast comes from CDW and Dell Technologies. At CDW, we get that migrating your business to a hyper-converged infrastructure is challenging. Like me switching to decaf. Gotta do it, don't wanna do it, but gotta do it. Whoa, slow down, friend. CDW's experts can help you simplify the transition from legacy to hyper-converged infrastructure with Dell Technologies solutions that offer speed and agility. Do it, do it. Have you done it? Is it done yet? Why isn't it done yet? IT orchestration by CDW. People who get it. Find out more at cdw.com slash Tech. This podcast is sponsored by Eddie Turner, LLC. Organizations who need to accelerate the development of their leaders call Eddie Turner the Leadership Accelerator. Eddie works with leaders to accelerate performance and drive impact. Call Eddie Turner to help your leaders one-on-one -on -one as their coach or to inspire them as a group through the power of facilitation or a keynote address. Visit eddieturnerllc.com to learn more. 
This is Jeffrey Hazlett, Chairman and CEO of the C-Suite Network, and you're listening to the Keep Leading Podcast with Eddie Turner. I want to tell you about my friends over at Grand Heron International. At Grand Heron, you'll see the address to the website here on the photo. Uh, The key to sustainable leadership lies in the ability to thrive during uncertainty, ambiguity, and change. Grand Heron International brings you the coaching assistance program, giving your employees on-demand coaching to manage through a challenging situation and arrive at a solution. Visit grandheroninternational.ca slash podcast to learn more. And a couple other sponsors I want to thank that came in for this month, American Express, Microsoft, specifically promoting their Teams platform, AT&T, Progressive, Walmart, Oracle, promoting the NetSuite product, Dropbox, Trilio, and Goldman Sachs launch with gs that's the product that they're promoting if you are watching us here now you can catch the archives on keepleadinglive.com this will be a podcast a regular podcast episode because i know that many of you about 20 percent of my listeners listen on their apple watch when they're working out so you'll catch be able to listen to this as a regular audio only episode in december this will be one of the closeout episodes for the year. So visit us at Keep Leading Live and keepleadingpodcast.com. Don't forget to stop by Apple Podcasts and give us a rating uh, if you believe that what we're offering is of value to you. I am talking to Bonnie Harvey and Michael Houlihan, founders of Barefoot Wine, America's number one brand. So you all told us a lot about culture before we took our break. And now as, we, as we're coming back, I wanted to ask you about business because you have so much business experience and your uh, other book that we mentioned about entrepreneurship. What is the biggest challenge you see facing businesses today? Mm. Engaging their people to stick with them. People with COVID, they're working from home. And um, it makes it a whole lot easier to be looking for another job that might pay just a little bit more. And without their coworkers around them, they start losing touch with the company and they may forget the principles that the founder had. Uh, And this is very dangerous because company culture, as we'd said before, comes from the top, comes from the owners and the top management of the company. And they're not getting that reinforced now. So I think it's really important to find a way to reinforce company, uh, good company culture by um, giving them the principles that the founder has in a way that they they will remember, that they will enjoy hearing, and that they will act upon to really engage them more so they will stay with the company and they'll act in a way that would make the founder proud. And speaking of staying with the company, I understand you all did such a fantastic job of creating a culture that people didn't leave for the last 10 years. You had no no one uh, resign. That's yes, that's right. Yeah, we had virtually no turnover. But, you know, that's after, you know, doing it wrong for five or seven years. You know, mm-hmm. it's uh, we learned our lessons the hard way. And uh, when we finally figured out what the keys to a positive company culture were, and we began to put ourselves in our employees' shoes, uh, and we began to realize that what they really wanted to know was, did we have their best interests at heart? And so what were their best interests? We had to really come down to it and and identify it and lay it out. And we did. And uh, we found out that there was four things that we were really interested in. Uh, Of course, number one uh, was remuneration. They had to pay their bills. You know, they got to put their kids through school. They have to pay their mortgage. Okay, so everybody knows that. Uh, But then number two uh, is a little bit more surprising, and that is they wanted recognition 
Uh, they wanted recognition, you know, from their fellow workers, and they wanted recognition from us as, as owners and founders. They wanted appreciation. Mm -hmm. So that meant that we had to engage them if if they would engage for us. And so that, that gets back to sharing problems and asking them for solutions and whatnot. And also coming out and saying when they did a good job and saying it publicly and saying it in writing and copying it to the entire company. That was really an important uh, breakthrough. And then the third thing that people want uh, is they want time off. You know, they want time off to spend, you know, with their kids or they want to have swing time or they want to have a life outside of work. So this is the part where you have to decide, you know, how much work from home can you do versus how much work in the office can you do? Uh, we gave them their, you know, their birthday off with pay, for instance, you know, and yes, they could swing the day to another day. And then the fourth thing that they're all looking for is security. And that means secure job. It means mm -hmm. secure retirement. It means secure medical. It means all of this stuff. It means all the social uh, support that that an employer can give them. So we figured out how to manage those four different areas and how to deliver. And once we started doing that, it made a huge difference. Mm -hmm. Sounds like you built it off Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Absolutely. We like Maslow. <laughs> well, that's wonderful. And you mentioned earlier about a money map, but I remember yeah. you actually described you all had quite a process where you just laid it out for everybody to be able to see it. Full transparency. Yes, the money map showed where the money comes from. And it was a, a physical map, a sheet of paper, and it shows that the money comes from the community, that that's where the consumer is. And it shows how that dollar that she, that, well, let's say $10 that she pays the clerk in the store for the bottle of wine, then the clerk takes a, a portion of, well, the owner takes a portion of that, pays the overhead, um, and then buys another replacement bottle of wine from the distributor. And that might be uh, $8. And then the distributor pays his overhead buys wine from uh, a wine bottle from us for five dollars so now we've got five dollars for that wine well the wine itself costs three dollars so that leaves us with one dollar for our overhead and one dollar into the big pot for everybody's check and for their benefits and for their vacation pay and for everything that they get is in that one pot of gold so if somebody wants a raise the only way they can get it is by increasing the sales and helping that dollar go all the way around and into the pot so the pot will get larger and then they can get a raise. So it all starts with the sale, doesn't it? Yeah, and by seeing the path that the money takes to get into your wallet, you become aware of every process and you begin to identify, you say, oh, this is where my job fits in. <laughs> you say, this is where I make a difference. Oh, here's here's where my, my fellow worker makes a difference. And here's how I supply my fellow worker with the information that he needs or she needs to do the job so that the cycle will continue to keep the cash flowing. And I think a lot of companies don't do that. We like to say, you know, when the cement is wet, you can move it with a trowel. But when it gets hard, you need a jackhammer. <laughs> so this is why this is the most important thing you can do in the onboarding uh, uh, day or two. People are going to answer all the questions they have about your company <laughs> the day they're hired, whether you give them the answers or they invent them. Yes. You don't That's want them so inventing true. answers because they'll invent answers that came from the last place they worked. Yes. So when you when you want to establish a company culture, the first thing you have to do is make sure that the blackboard or the whiteboard is clean. See? And then the first thing you put on the blackboard or the whiteboard, whatever you want to call it, is the money map. You give them a picture of an actual graphic, uh, you know, treasure map, and they they see it. And if that's all they get, believe me, they are miles ahead. Mm -hmm. And you are miles ahead right there. So that's a big secret for us. The money. It was huge. 
I mean, you all shared that with us at the meeting and all of our, our jaws just dropped. It, it was incredible because it's like we the light bulb went off for us and we bought a part of the company. So we can only imagine what that must have been like for uh, the employees. It sounds very basic and it is, but it's not something that owners generally think of. And employee will think that the money comes from the owner. Yes. The money comes from the company. But you know, the company and the owner aren't necessarily independently wealthy that they can afford to support everyone on the staff. And as strange as that sounds, uh, it really is an eye opener to see the money map. Yes. Thanks for appreciating that, Eddie. Oh, absolutely. Well, I, you all talked about lessons you all learned and how long it took you to learn them and then how you turned that into an amazing success and that the true success was about the people not the product, but you still made an incredibly uh, impressive product that has gone around the world. Yes. What lessons would you say, if you just had to just take one of the many that you've learned that could keep other leaders who are listening to us uh, from bumping their heads a little bit, they could, they, they, they could avoid, what's just one you could share? Put yourself in the other guy's shoes. The other guys, everyone that you do business with, it could be in your personal life, too. It certainly works in your personal life. Put yourself in the other guy's shoes. Find out what it feels like. Talk to them and find out what their needs are and fulfill their needs. Then you'll be successful. In other words, don't fall in love with your product. Yes, you have to have a fantastic product. It's got to be knocking it out of the park. It's just got to be destroying the competition. But even with that, you'll fail. See, because there's warehouses in Des Moines, Iowa, that are filled with great products that never made it to market. And the reason they didn't was because the owners, the founders and the companies that were behind them didn't know how to put themselves in the other guy's shoes and satisfy their problems so that it could move along and get into distribution. You know, we speak all over the world, and one of the big questions that we get all the time is, how do you sell products in the United States? We want to sell products in the United States. It's the best market in the world. Well, it's because we have so many freeways here. You know, uh, General Eisenhower, after the war, he said, okay, we're going to build an interstate highway system. Well, that resulted in trucks. That resulted in big container loads of trucks. And so the most efficient way to move things was by big container loads. But people are not going to buy a big container load if they don't like you. They're not <laughs> going to buy a big container load if they can't trust you. Yes. And so how do you build that trust? How do you get them to know, like, and trust you? So that's the key to success in America. And it's the key to success throughout the world, actually. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Well, as I think about uh, a lot of the things I like to share with leaders, uh, we always like to leave them with one tip. I'm sorry, with one uh, quote that they can live by. You all have given us several great quotes throughout the conversation today. But is there one last quote that you use that you live by that you can share with us as well? There's the two division company. All companies have two divisions. Sales, that's on top. And sales support, that's everybody else. Okay. That's the CEO, the CFO, the COO, it's the VP, it's even the P. We're all in sales support. That is a great quote. I appreciate that. Now, I pointed out the, earlier this, uh, this cover because I wanted to show the foot, but I want to go back to this for a moment if I could, because there's a story behind this. Can you all talk about what this is for my listeners? Well, this is actually the story behind the story. So what this is, is our new audio book, which is different than other audiobooks. Most audiobooks are read to you. This audiobook is performed for you. It is fully casted. It has sound effects. It has music. It is dramatic. It is gripping. Uh, it is a seat of your pants rocket ride on an entrepreneurial adventure where you will accompany Michael and Bonnie as they get their butts kicked, pick themselves up off the sidewalk, <laughs> learn a few lessons, dust themselves off, and proceed onward. And, it, and I think you'll enjoy it. 
It was one of the top five audiobooks of the year by the Audiobook Publishers Association. Congratulations. You know, and business books are pretty boring. You know, it's the three things you got to do, the five things to never do, the 20 things your customer wants from you. I forget them. On, on number three, I'm done. See, so this <laughs> isn't like that at all. This is not patronistic. This is not uh, anybody telling you anything. This yes. is you experiencing acting in scenes, and they're fun, and you'll enjoy it. And you'll, you'll walk away with some really good ideas. You'll say, man, I don't want to be like Jim. You know, I remember what happened to Jim. And so there's a lot of Jims and Marys and Janes in this book, and they do a lot of things. So the, every scene has action. It has outtakes. It has consequences. It's how we built our company culture. It's the philosophy that we use that was very successful. And it's all told in story form because people can remember stories. Yes. They're not going to remember do these three or seven things. But if I give you three or seven stories, that's what you're going to remember. And then you glean the message out of that makes it memorable. And so we're going to make it memorable for you. We're going to offer every listener to Eddie's podcast is going to get a free chapter so this is like an episode, a 25-minute episode. You're going to get it for free. We're going to have the download link in the show notes. Well, that's so, very generous of you all. Thank you for doing it. I hope you all enjoy it. Well, I, I am delighted. And just thank you so much. And thank you for being here with me today. Where can my listeners learn more about you two? Well, you can go to www the barefoot spirit, just like the name of our book, thebarefootspirit.com. Okay, excellent. So I'll be putting that in the show notes along with a copy of the two books that you've produced so folks can read about you all, follow you on social media. If they aren't following you on social media, follow you on social media. The Barefoot uh, Story, the Barefoot Spirit is a wonderful spirit about the culture that you all have created. And you're just amazing people who've done amazing work. Thank you for being with me today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eddie. Thank you, Eddie. And thank you for everybody for tuning in. Yes, thank you all for tuning in. That concludes this episode, everyone. I am Eddie Turner reminding you that leadership is not about our title or our position. Leadership is about action. Leadership is about activity. It's not the case of once a leader, always a leader. We must be a leader at our core and allow it to emanate from all that we do. So whatever you're doing, Always keep leading. Thank you for listening to your host, Eddie Turner, on the Keep Leading Podcast. Please remember to subscribe to the Keep Leading Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen. For more information about Eddie Turner's work, please visit eddieturnerllc.com. Thank you for listening to C-Suite Radio, turning the volume up on business. Hey, C-Suite Radio listeners, Jeffrey Hazel here, Chairman and CEO of the C-Suite Network. Has your business been seriously affected by COVID-19? Are you having trouble getting a loan to meet payroll? Is government red tape causing your business to shut down? Well, we're here to help. C-Suite Loans is a business program designed to provide companies just like yours with immediate access to capital that will keep your business not only afloat, but driving and thriving. C-Suite Loans works in conjunction with vetted funding to provide you with the best options based on your financial needs. We understand the challenges and we have a solution. Visit csuiteloans.com today to learn more. Once again, that's c-suite, S-U-I-T-E, loans.com.